If you got a glimpse of the future, how would that change your life? If you're able to have a vision of end time events, how would that change your life? My second son is a diehard Cowboys fan and he's 24 years old. And as long as he can remember, he's been a Cowboys fan. He's been hoping that the Cowboys win the Super Bowl. Well, as you know, the Cowboys haven't won the Super Bowl since the early 1990s. So he's never experienced it. But each season, he's hopeful that the Cowboys will win. And each season, he's disappointed. And last season, he was so disappointed, he wanted to give up on the Cowboys. Totally. He was done with it. He couldn't handle the stress and couldn't handle the pressure. But I was wondering if he got a glimpse into the future and he saw that the Cowboys were going to win a Super Bowl, whether it would be next year or five years from now, how would that change his attitude? I think he would change it for the future, for the better, because he would know that the suffering that he's going through and the hardship that he's going through and, the, and all those emotions that are going up and down, it would be for a reason because he knows eventually the Cowboys will win another Super Bowl. So my question to you is that how would your life change if you got a glimpse into the future and you knew that the battle was won? Stay tuned for this lesson. Let's see what winning looks like. Hello, my name is Reverend Dr. John W. Wilson III, bringing you the Sunday School lesson for this Sunday, August 7th, 2022. The lesson is, is entitled, A New Home, will come from the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 1 through 9. Revelation, chapter 21, verses 1 through 9. Before we get started, a couple of things. I want to thank Reverend Andre Anderson for bringing the lesson, a powerful lesson, on last week. Uh, I'm going to just... I appreciate him tremendously. He's my, one of my very best friends. I want to thank my wife and my fourth oldest son who brought the lesson the week before. Did an awesome job too. So I want to just give my kudos to them. I appreciate them very much. But if you like this lesson that we're going to talk about today, I want you to subscribe, share, or like this uh, YouTube video, uh, especially if you think it will help somebody else. If you Feel led to leave a comment in the comment section. I always love to hear from you. And thank you for those who have left messages and comments in the comment section. So let's get right into this lesson. Uh, we're talking about the book of Revelation, the unveiling or the unveiling of uh, spiritual realities or things to come. Uh, if you look at the purpose of the book of Revelation, it will say in chapter one, let me read that to you. And John gives us the reason why he wrote it. The revelation of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is giving John this message. Okay, the first three chapters, John's gonna talk about the seven churches of the providence, uh, Roman providence of Asia, which is our modern day Turkey. He's gonna to speak to them. But going from chapter four to 22, he has a vision. And that vision is from Jesus Christ speaking through him to us. So the purpose of the book of Revelation or the revelation to John is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. The things that must soon take place. This is written around AD 95, 96. Again, it's written by the apostle John, the beloved one, beloved disciple of Jesus Christ. He is exiled in Patmos. He's of age. This is the last thing he will write. And uh, he wants us to, this is book of inspiration. A lot of people think it's a lot of confusion because it had a lot of symbolism. But I think once we get past the symbolism, we can understand what John is saying to us. Uh, you have, we have to understand that uh, from the point that Jesus left to his second coming, things for Christians are going to get progressively worse. Uh, you may think we have it bad now, 
But as we get closer to the second coming of Jesus, the persecution will be ramped up. Why? Because Satan knows that his time is short. Satan knows what the end will bring, and he's going to try to take down or cause as much chaos as he possibly can from the time now until Jesus comes back. So we can look forward to, to chaos, to persecution, to murders, to injustice, to idolatry, to sexual immorality. I think if we had to be honest today, we can see ourselves going down that direction. What used to be right is now wrong. Uh, what used to be wrong is now right. Our world is turning upside down. And what we have to do as Christians is to turn it right side up. And the one of the ways we do that is to persevere through the struggles that are, that are in front of us. And so John is writing this as an encouragement to those who will struggle, those who are suffering while he's writing it now, those who are suffering in, my, in our present reality, and those who are suffering in the future. And he wants to tell us that the suffering is worth it because we, I'm giving you a glimpse of what the end is going to look at. And God is so awesome because when we, when we go through our suffering, when, when we go through our injustice, uh, when things are not going right, when we're frustrated about this world, and when we see things are getting progressively worse, we can be, uh, our spirit can be dampened. It can be taken down a level. But if we read Revelation and we read it and study it, we know in the end, the victory is won. The forces of Jesus wins out against the forces of Satan. It's not even close. The injustice that the Christians will suffer, they will have the reward one day in heaven. The ones who are causing the injustice one day will have to stand before the great white throne and face their punishment. And so this book needs to be looked at as upon as an encouragement. Uh, as we progress toward the coming of Jesus, there will be false teachers. Uh, there will be uh, the spiritual warfare will intense. The sexual immorality will grow worse. The injustice will increase. Christians will be beheaded, murdered, persecuted. All those things will happen. But this gives us the end game and said we win in the end. So Jesus says to hang in there. In the book of Revelation, it means the unveiling of something. So John is, Jesus through John is unveiling the spiritual realities of what's going to happen in the future. And so uh, this gives us a little background of what's happening, going on. Let's go to our, our chapter 21 and we'll see what's happening there. But my goal is what I want you to understand is hang in there. This chapter 21 tells us as Christians who persevere, Christians who may have died for the cause, Christians who may have suffered injustice in the name of Jesus, look what we have to look forward to. So as we come to chapter 21, if we look at quickly at chapter 20, we see a lot of things have happened. Uh, Jesus has won the battle. Uh, Jesus, uh, Satan force has been, has been defeated. The beast and the antichrist have now been put into the fiery pit, the lake of fire. And then later on in chapter 20, in the beginning of it, it says Satan has been bound for a thousand years. A thousand years he's bound. Okay, the gospel spreads. And then after the end of thousand years, the Bible says around verse 7 of chapter 20, he's let loose to wreak havoc. And boy, does he wreak havoc. But then he, then, then he himself are put into the lake of fire. And those who follow him stand before the great white throne and receive their judgment. And they are eventually put into the lake of fire. Then you might say, well, what happened to the, to the um, believer? What's going on? Well, this is, what's, this is what's happening. The old is going away and the new is being bought in. Meaning that God is keeping to his word and he's doing away with the old way, the old thing that was full of sin, full of suffering, suffering full of persecution. Those are no more. And now he's ushering in a new way of life. And this is what he says. Uh, after all those things have happened, the great white throne of judgment, Satan being put into the lake of fire, 
along with the beast and the Antichrist, all the, the followers of Jesus, um, followers of Satan, the unbelievers, have received their judgment. Then he receives another vision from Jesus. He says, then I saw in his vision. A vision differs from a dream. A dream happens when you're sleeping. You remember Joseph had dreams. It's when he was sleeping when he has it. A vision is something similar to a dream, but you're wide awake. You're awake while this vision is happening. So John is awake and in his vision, he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the new earth had passed away. So what God, what Jesus is saying through John is that that old thing that we knew about is gone. I'm ushering in a new heaven and a new earth. Now there's a little controversy of what new heaven and new earth means. The literal translation means that the old earth has been destroyed or the new heaven has been done away with. It exists no longer. It's disappeared. It has vanished. And he brought in something new. Now there's another train of thought which I tend to agree with is that the new heaven and new earth is a renewing or transformation or glorification of the existing earth and existing heaven. And I say, why do I say that? Uh, I say that one, I look at Romans 8, 13, 8, 19. It talks about a law uh, the earth is longing uh, for a, a new creation. It's long. In fact, I'm going to turn to it. Romans 8, 19. I think it, it warrants me to say that. Romans 8, 19. And it reads this. For creation once and eagerly longs for the revealing of the sons of God is waiting for the second coming of Jesus, okay? If the, if the creation was not eagerly longing, uh, then uh, you can talk about a new heaven and new earth. But since it's eagerly longing, it itself is actually waiting for what is almost like a resurrection for us. You got to remember in our resurrected body, we're going to still look the same, but we're going to be a new creature, a new a creation, a new creature, and so the same way, the earth is going to be the same way. It's going to be a, have a, a semblance of the old, maybe in looks or, or structure or foundation, but it will be completely new, just like us. And so the earth is longing for that day, is longing for that day. Let's look at Isaiah uh, 6, 65, 17. And this answers another question, Isaiah 65, 17. Okay. And this is this is really a good verse. It says, "For behold, I create new heavens and new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind." What does that answer the question? A lot of people say, "Well, in heaven, what about my uh, past life? What about my past sins? What about my loved ones who are not in heaven? How would I be able to deal with those things?" And here it says, "Those things." will pass away and not be remembered. We will not have a memory of our past life, all the bad things we may have done, the sinful things we may have done. We, may not be, we, may, we will not remember of our loved ones, our friends who, who are no longer, who are not in heaven, who are in a lake of fire. So those memories will be taken away from us. And then the last passage I wanna look at is, is Philippians 3.17. Philippians 3.17. Let me get that for you. 3.17. And it's going to read this. Brothers, join me in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you're in. For many of whom I have often told you, tell you, even with the, the tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly, okay? Let's continue. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. We talked about that. For the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. We talked about that. We gave those verses there. And the sea was no more. The sea, what is the sea? The sea, when I read this, you think that the new heaven and new earth is not going to have any body of water. Uh, it's not going to have any rivers. Uh, it's not going to have any streams but down have lakes, but that's not true. The sea here is symbolic of something that it means the evils of this world, the afflictions of this world, the sufferings of this world, the wrongdoings of this world, the injustices of this world, 
all those will be no more. So the sea is, is a symbolic of everything that is bad will be no more in this new heaven and new earth. You got to remember that the well, reason why we have a new heaven and new earth, okay, it says this, for the old earth has passed away. You know, when you go into a new house or you go into a new part of your life, very oftentimes people will buy new furniture for that house. You don't want anything in that new house sometimes to remind you of what happened in the old house. And so by us going to a new heaven and new earth, we can't bring anything of the old heaven and new earth into our new heaven and new earth. It just can't happen. We can't bring it into. So we have a, a new heaven and new earth because the battle has been won. Satan has been defeated. And all those pains and struggles that we've gone through cannot go with us to this new heaven and earth. All right? And said, all that has passed away. And the sea was no more as a double emphasis of all that affliction, all that pain and suffering. That will not go with us into this new heaven and new earth. Then he looks up and he says, I saw a holy city, a city from God. And New Jerusalem, it represents the church. The, even the old Jerusalem is done away with. But this new Jerusalem will be full of God's people, full of believers, those who remain loyal to him. You know, this new Jerusalem will be coming out of heaven from God. God will send this new Jerusalem, this church, these bodies of people uh, from God. And, it, and this new church will be prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. When you look at a bride that is prepared for her husband, that bride is pretty. That bride is sharp. That bride is adorned. That bride is beautiful, beautified. She may not be beautiful on the day before, and she may not be beautiful on the day after, but on that wedding day, she looks magnificent. She looks beautiful. She looks great. And so what God has done, this holy city in which God will dwell, this new Jerusalem in which God's people will be, it will come down from heaven, from God, and it will look so beautiful as a bride adorned for her new husband. And look what he says in verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. So we got this new Jerusalem. will be on this new heaven and earth. This new Jerusalem is that we will dwell is sent from heaven. It will be the church. And then God himself will come from down from heaven. And this new Jerusalem will be a new dwelling place. Mean that he will dwell with his people. Mean that he will, not only will he just be there, but he will have fellowship with his people. You remember that uh, in the Old Testament, uh, his dwelling was, in the temple was, uh, was temporary because the temple got destroyed. In the tabernacle, that was a temporary dwelling place. But in this place right here, on this new Jerusalem, on this new heaven and earth, guess what? That indwelling or that dwelling with his people will last for an eternity. It will last forever. It says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne, from God's throne. This is God's talking. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. The relationship is solidified. The relationship is there and it lasts forever. We will be forever relationship with God. We'll be forever in fellowship with God. And that's what's happening in the new heaven and new earth. That's why we can't have any baggage. That's why we can't bring in the old emotion, the old things with us. That's why God says we have to forget about what happened on this old earth, even the people there, in order to enjoy and fully understand and enjoy the relationship and the fellowship that we have with God. It says, and God himself will be with them as their God. 
Boy, see what we have to look forward to? In the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our persecution, in the midst of our injustice, we have to remember as we go, get closer and closer to this, the, the day when which Jesus comes back, it will be immensely hard. It will be unreal. Right now, in America, we have it easy. We're not quite yet persecuted. We have to put up with a lot of frustration and inconveniences, but we are nowhere near the persecution that will take place. Other parts of the world are experiencing significant persecution, dying for the cause. And that will intensify as the day in which Jesus returns comes closer. All right? And guess what he says? He will dwell with them. He'll be with his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. One of the things that this new heaven and earth will have, will not have, is death. Death will not be part of it. Death is part of the old earth and the old heaven. And guess what? Because God is dwelling with us and because there's perfect fellowship and because we will have eternal life, there will be no death. It says right here, he will wipe away every tear from our eyes and death shall be no more. In the new heaven and earth, there's no death. In the new heaven and earth, there's no crime because of suffering, because of persecution, because of loss of a loved one. There will be just tears of joy, but there will be no crying like it was in the old earth. There will be no death like it was in the old earth. That will be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, neither shall be no crying, there will be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. The former things. The things of the old earth have now passed away. Everything that is bad in the old earth has gone away, never to be brought in into the new earth. In other words, we're going to experience complete joy, complete bless, unhindered fellowship with God. There will be no distractions. There will be none of those crying and mourning that we experience, those painful things that we experience, you know, that will go away. Our focus will be completely on God and the fellowship and the relationship that we have with him. We have a lot to look forward to. The victory is won. It is going to be better than we can even imagine. God's going to dwell with us in this new Jerusalem. Can you imagine that? The presence of God with us, the glory of God illuminating the new Jerusalem. Can you imagine that? It's going to be awesome. And the former things, the things that we hate about this earth, our inadequacies, inadequacies our shortcomings, our wrongdoings, our propensity to sin, to do wrong, to hurt other people, all those things will go away. It will not be part of us because the battle has been won. And he who was seated on the throne said, God, behold, look, that means like with urgency. I am making all things new. All things were going to be new. You want a new start in life? This is our new start in life. You want to look forward to something fantastic? This is our, our time to look forward to something glorious. All things were going to be new. We're going to be new. Heaven and earth is going to be new. Everything that we know will be new, will be transformed. It will be glorified by God. We'll have our new bodies. No more pain, no more issue, no more arthritis, no more cancer, no more, none of that stuff. We have new bodies. And those things that happen in the old world are not brought to this new earth. Understand that. I am making all things new. And he said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. I am making all things. That, write it down. I'm, God said, I'm giving you my word. It's called, it, all things are going to be new. I'm giving you my word. It is trustworthy and true. Double emphasis. You can trust me because what I'm saying is true. And he said to me, it is done. Meaning that everything that needed to be accomplished by Christ has been completed. It is done. It is finished. 
All right, we are in eternal life. The, all that suffering it is over. We have nothing but heavenly bliss and heavenly fellowship to look forward to because it is completely done. The victory has been won. It's time to celebrate and enjoy this, the spoils of your labor, the rewards that God has for you, all that. It's time to enjoy the fellowship with God. I am the Alpha Omega. The reason why it's done, because I am the beginning and the end. I am in every, uh, Jesus said, I am everything in between. I control all things. All things happen through me. And, it be, and because it happens through me, I'm the beginning and the end. You know that it is finished. I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I control all things. I was there when things started. I was there when things came to the end. I was there in all between, and I controlled all things. I was sovereign over all things. I made this happen. Everything went according to plan. I am the beginning, the beginning, and the, I'm the Alpha Omega. That's, that makes me think that Christ is worthy of our trust. The worthy to be our Lord. I'm the Alpha and Omega. If he couldn't say that, he wouldn't be he wouldn't be worthy of our trust. But because he is, the beginning and the end and everything in between and controls all things, he's worthy of our trust. It says to the thirsty. That means those who have spiritual needs, those who are craving for fellowship with God. I will give them the spring of water without payment. I mean, I'm going to give you something that's free. That's something that's through grace. The spring of water is eternal fellowship with God. To those who are thirsty, yearning for that fellowship with God, I'm going to give you a spring of the water of life without payment. That spring will never end and it costs you nothing. I'm going to satisfy every spiritual need you have. To the one who conquers, that means to the one who perseveres through all this struggle and injustice for the sake of Christ. Now, we're not talking about persevering because you've done something wrong. We're talking about persevering in the name of Jesus because you're a believer of Jesus Christ. And that belief in Jesus Christ and that outspokenness has caused you to suffer and be persecuted. To those who have endured will have this heritage meaning that they will have complete fellowship with God throughout eternity. They will have the blessings of God throughout eternity. They will have this gift of being part of this new heaven and new earth. And those who are able to endure and to conquer, to rise above and stay true to God, they will get these blessings and not only that, I will be his God and he will be my son. You will come into God's family. You will be adopted in. This is part of your rewards. I don't know what all that means, but I know it's good. And I know it's worth it. But as for the cowardly, this is where the tone changes in this passage. You know what the cowardly is? Those who say they're Christians, but when it comes down to uh, being persecuted or come down to taking a stand for Christ, they back off and they become cowardly and they go back into the world. They, they, they don't stand up for Christ. They don't be, they're not bold for Christ. Uh, they compromise for Christ. They get scared about worrying about what somebody else is going to think. They worry about uh, what other people are thinking. And they, therefore, they cannot stand for Christ. Jesus calls them cowardly. Lukewarm. Stands for nothing. When the pedal hits the metal, they fold in the name of Jesus. They fold. And they're cowardly. I think they're listed first because this is the worst type of person. Someone who, and you know, uh, Martin Luther King talks about his greatest disappointment was not the way his enemies treated. It was where those who said they were his friends and supported them, and when it came down to support him and, and stand behind him, they ran away. That hurt Martin Luther King more than anything else. And that hurts God more than anything else. The faithless, those who reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, 
He says he's listing his lips because just like we have a place in this new heaven and earth, they have a place, but it's not going to be in the new heaven and new earth. It's going to be somewhere else. We're going to find out what it is. The faithless, those who reject Jesus Christ as their Lord and servant, the detestable, those who are who are, who are idol worship, those who worship the, the, the wrong king, those who are involved in all kind of mayhem and chaos and immorality. They do detestable things. And then the murderers, those who kill people, the sexual and immor immoral, those who are incestuous, those who are, who are involved in uh, homosexual relationships, bisexual relationships, all this kind of stuff, all this kind of sexual immorality, those who commit adultery, fornication, any type of sexual immorality that's different from a man and woman and that's outside of a relationship, a marriage covenant between a man and woman is sexual immorality. Sorcerers, those who worship the stars, who, who put their faith in astrology and, and mathematical calculations. Idolaters, those who worship idols, materialistic people who may put money before them and all liars, those who just can't tell the truth. Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur which is the second death. You see, you and I, we don't, we don't experience the second death. We are born twice, die once. The people that I just listed are born once and they die twice. We are born, then we die, then we're born, we have a spiritual death, and then we have a, we're born again. Okay? We do suffer a physical death, but we, but we, but we, are, we have resurrected bodies. So we, we die once, but we're resurrected. And so it's like we're born again. Okay? And then those who aren't, they die twice. They're born as a baby, they die in the flesh, and then they die a spiritual death. And that's where they remain throughout eternity. And that's called the second death. The second death is that spiritual death that John is talking about. What do we learn from here? We look at verse nine, conclude with this. Then came to one of the seven angels who had seven bowls of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. That's the church is the wife of the lamb. As we were to continue, verse 11, it's gonna show you how First, all the way through, it's going to show you how beautiful that bride looks. Amen? So here, what do we learn about this? Hang in there. Just like we uh, we know what the end is going to look like. You know, just like you're watching a movie and you you can't, you, you're intense, you're upset. But if you, te if you fast forward to the end, you see the end and you see the victory. You see that the good guy wins and the bad guy is punishment. And you see that what you believed all along was right and true. And you see what the reward is waiting for you. That ought to strengthen us as we suffer in the name of Jesus Christ, as we go through frustration in the name of Jesus Christ. That, it, that ought to embolden us to want to share the gospel and stand for the gospel and not be cowardly and not be faithless. And it ought to encourage us to, to live right. Because the Bible says the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, the murderers, the sexual morality. And, so, and all of these people think they're going to be in heaven, but they're not. You need to ask yourself, can and when the pedal hit the metal, you need to prepare yourself now that if I have to, this comes a time when I have to stand for Christ, I will stand for Christ. I will not back down, even if it costs me my life, even if it costs me everything I have. I'm going to stand for Christ. We need to make up our mind right now before that time comes. So when that time comes, it's second nature. We already know what we're going to do because we already made that decision in advance that we're going to stand for Christ. If you're faithless, if you haven't given your life to Jesus Christ, now's the time. Do it right now. The detestable, we're caught up in some sinful lifestyle. The time right now is to ask to repent and ask for forgiveness and turn away from your evil ways and turn to the righteous ways of Christ. 
It is not too late. But when you stand before the great white throne of judgment or when you die, it is too late. You will experience that second death. And it will be like nothing that you ever experienced before. It will be like nothing that you can even imagine. You'll be in the same situation with Satan and his angels and his demons, the Antichrist and the beast. You'll be in the same pit of hell with them, the same lake of fire. Please don't let that happen. Give Jesus a chance. Allow him to come into your heart. Don't experience that second death. God has so much planned for you and me. It's unreal. And it lasts forever. Don't go through this life frustrated. Don't go through this life saying, woe is me and have a negative outlook on this life. No, you may not like anything that's happening in here. You may not like what's going on, but we know in the end, guess what? We win. Those who stay, those who follow Jesus win. God is glorified. God is right. God has proven himself to be true. Your suffering, your faith has not been in vain. God has a new home for us. Just for believers. Just for those who follow him. Just for those who persevere. We have a new home. The former things have passed away. That means that the former things don't compare to what we'll be experiencing in the future. May God bless you. Thank you for the minute. I missed you guys. I'll see you next week. Have a great Sunday. Have an even greater Sunday school. God bless you.